the major issues that dairy producers deal with in, in our area have to do with uh, environmental issues or uh, over uh, feeding of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, would have been on the list uh, for, for a long time. Uh, of course, methane emission is, is of concern. This is why the university is focusing on establishing this large dairy. Welcome back to another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. And this week we have the pleasure of welcoming two colleagues from the University of Idaho to the show, Drs. Pedram Rezumon and Amy Skimmel. So first of all, Dr. Rezumon is a professor of dairy nutrition with the Animal Veterinary and Food Sciences Department and in the College of Ag and Life Sciences at the University of Idaho. Prior to joining the faculty at Idaho, he had a postdoctoral training at Michigan State University with Dr. Lorraine Sordillo and at the University of Idaho with Dr. Mark McGuire. After com- completing his PhD in animal science under Sheila Andrews um, in, at the University of Connecticut, excuse me, he started his faculty position in November of 2008. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses, and his research focuses on nutrient metabolism, and oxidative stress in lactating animals, as well as calf nutrition and health. He's also been very actively involved with planning and organizing the Pacific Northwest Animal Nutrition Conference since 2009 and has actually chaired that conference since 2013. He lives with his family in Moscow, Idaho, in northern Idaho, and enjoys coaching youth sports and nature photography. For her uh, side, Dr. Skibble is an assistant professor of lactation physiology in the same department at the University of Idaho, and she joined the faculty in 2018. She completed her PhD in biological sciences under Wendy Hood at Auburn University. Uh, She came to Idaho from a postdoc in animal sciences at the University of Florida under Dr. Jeff Dahl and Dr. Himanil Laporta. And before that, held a postdoc position in human evolutionary biology at Harvard University with Dr. Katie Hind. Amy teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in lactation biology and environmental physiology and her research program involves the study of metabolic adaptations to lactation and impacts of environmental stresses on dairy cattle health and production from molecular to whole organism levels. And for the past two years, uh, Amy's been investigating the effects of particulates and wildfire smoke on cattle health and performance in collaboration with Pedram. All right, with those behind us, before we get down to business, Pedram, what, what sports or what what sport do you coach? I'm curious. Soccer. Soccer. Is is it fair of me to ask, like, what's your lifetime record as a coach? Oh, uh, I have to calculate <laughs> that. I, I don't have to pop my head, but um, I enjoy it. I used to play, and now I, I share my experience with younger players. So now that you're collaborating with Amy, have you ever pulled her in for some sort of physiology insight so you can get a leg up, pun intended? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I uh, no. <laughs> Maybe that's an idea for next season. Yeah. And I don't know soccer. I know hockey. I play oh, okay. hockey. Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Amy, I'm, I'm curious. You've been at Idaho for about four years now, correct? Correct. And my assumption from your CV is that you hadn't really done much related to air quality before coming to Idaho. What made you decide to start working on effects of wildfire related particulates in your research program here in Idaho? Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair question. (laughs) So my background training really is in lactation biology. And then um, through my previous postdoc position and some of the work that I'm um, continuing to do here at UI was focused on heat stress. So I'm very much a lactation biologist and environmental physiologist. I'm really interested in how different environmental conditions modulate animal health and milk synthesis. And so this was kind of a bit of a natural progression, I think, from heat stress studies to just a different environmental condition. So when I arrived here, I had heard from several colleagues of mine and students about how bad wildfire season is here. And typically every year, there's at least a week or two weeks, sometimes even three weeks, of pretty heavy particulates from wildfire smoke that's coming from either southern Idaho or or around our area, um, from California, from Oregon and Washington. And so Padram and I actually 
were driving back from Boise, Idaho. When was that? Three years ago from the Pacific Northwest Animal Nutrition Conference. <laughs> and we had about a five and a half hour drive. And we were just talking about, you know, our research and what happens here in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm from the, the Northeast. And then my time in the Southeast for graduate school and for that postdoc position in Florida. And so wildfires were not really on my radar until I moved out here. But we got to talking about that and decided, hey, why don't we do a project? Nobody is studying this. And that's that kind of launched all of this collaborative work that we've been doing for the past several years now. That makes a lot of sense. So Pindram, like, help, help me understand, you, you maybe started that uh, planted that seed with Amy. So in your interactions with dairy producers and, and advisors in the Pacific Northwest, how high is this on the radar? I mean, there's a lot of things to think about if you're running a dairy farm. Is this a, like a serious concern in your region? Excellent question. If you had asked me this question when I started as a faculty, I would have said that no, their major concerns are uh, elsewhere. Sure. Uh, but uh, over the past 10 years or so, this has uh, creeped up on the list. Basically, uh, the major issues that dairy producers deal with in, in our area have to do with uh, environmental issues, uh, over uh, feeding of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, would have been on the list uh, for, for a long time. Uh, of course, methane emission is, is of concern. This is why the university is focusing on establishing this large dairy. And uh, effect of, of uh, wildfire smoke on animal health and also on crop production related to dairy, such as alfalfa and corn for corn silage, becoming uh, quite the uh, concern. Just a few months ago, Amy and I led another effort to put together a uh, research and extension uh, program uh, submitted to Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education that involves directly uh, producers and, and several objectives that we proposed in this proposal, newest proposal, uh, came straight from producers. They're concerned with the housing type because of uh, the air coming in. Yep. They're also concerned with the forage production, alfalfa, corn for corn silage. Uh, um, we have open lots here. Uh, we're talking cross-ventilated barn, so there's a lot of... Uh, activities and, and, and concerns uh, surrounding this topic now, it's just getting worse, basically. Year by year, it's just getting worse. Can I interject and, yeah, and answer a little bit too? Or, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, you know, if you look at the popular press articles too, I think there are reports out there of interviews with producers where they have been um, seeing just correlationally that, um, it seems like milk production is declining when there's smoke, but obviously that's just observational and it's a correlation. Obviously, there are other things happening in the summer, too, like we do get heat stress out here in the Pacific Northwest, too, not quite as severe as the southern United States, but we still do have heat stress days. Um, and obviously, drought is a problem, too, and that's going to affect milk yield. Um, and so I think producers are paying attention to it. Also, our Collaborators at Oregon State University have a publication where they actually put surveys out and ask for producer perceptions about wildfires. And that was listed as a major concern for producers in the area. Okay. So you have pretty solid quantitative data that this really is on on the list. Yes. So let's help me understand then you're approaching this as scientists, right? So this is a concern, but you're starting to get into how do we start a put numbers to things and, and pin down exactly what we're observing. How is air quality typically quantified for starters? So <clears throat> the Environmental Protection Agency has um, monitoring stations, really they're, they're state run by, you know, the in independent Department of Environmental Quality or whatever it's called in each specific state. They have a series of monitoring stations around the state and that all feeds into EPA databases. Um, those monitoring stations are usually um, recording uh, different concentrations of air pollutants, such as ozone, um, coarse particulate matter, which um, consists of particulates. So these are part of solid particles and lip uh, 
liquid, <laughs> liquid droplets yep. <laughs> um, that are suspended in air, and they're just categorized based on size. So PM10, the coarse particles are two and a half to 10 micrometers in diameter. Um, and then there's also the fine particles that are, that's PM2.5, which are smaller than two and a half micrometers in diameter. Then there's the ultra fine particles that are smaller than 0.1 uh, micro micrometers in diameter. And so they're monitoring stations that are monitoring different air pollutants. Those are typically the biggest ones. Um, oftentimes in more rural areas, the monitoring stations are only recording uh, PM 2.5. When you get into the more urban areas, larger metropolitan areas, typically those monitoring stations are picking up other air pollutants as well, like ozone, for example. So air quality is really based around all of those, whatever the monitoring stations are actually quantifying and recording in that specific area. So in our area, the monitoring stations around here are recording PM 2.5. So air quality is based on that. Okay. And to, to put it in context, if you're, you know, reasonably close to a wildfire, let's say it's, I don't know, five miles away, you're obviously going to see smoke and haze. You might actually see some ash. I, I'm presuming most of the haze or the smoke would be in that PM 2.5 range and that ash that might settle out would be even bigger than PM 10. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. All right, so that gives us some sense of what we're talking about. So given that we have these metrics, you're mostly using PM 2.5. Do you have any kind of numbers to give people that are not living in these regions a sense of like, how often is this really a problem in Idaho? So is it 10 days a year you have these issues where these are numbers that are considered harmful or, or how often? Usually what ha uh, in the past 10 years, when I look at the uh, trends, um, we used to have about a week, maybe two at most, but those days are just becoming uh, uh, longer. Basically, we are dealing with situations where we have a minimum of two to three weeks every year that we have some level of uh, dangerous uh, air quality. Not, not all of them are at the highest level, but at certain point, uh, it's become unhealthy for certain groups of people, sensitive groups. And at some level, it becomes unhealthy for everybody. Again, just to help me just get some basic understanding here, what I don't even know what the, what the concentration units would be, but what kind of number would be considered a problem for people with respiratory conditions, for example? The U.S. EPA considers PM2.5 a criteria pollutant, which means that there are nationally established standards for human outdoor exposure. Okay. And that cutoff is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So that's the cutoff for human outdoor exposure over a 24 hour period. Typically when there's wildfire smoke, we see anywhere between 50 to 500 micrograms per cubic meter. Okay. So just to give you an idea of that. So if the levels are above that 35 microgram per cubic meter cutoff, that's considered unhealthy, typically for sensitive groups. And then when the concentrations get even higher, upwards of 50, 75, 100, and so on, there are different levels of um, potential risk for different populations. I should add that the sum will get trans translated to air quality index. So a lot of people use the air quality index. And once you're past air quality index of 100, it becomes uh, dangerous for uh, a lot of people. And unfortunately, you guys have also like personally experienced this as humans. <laughs> so, so if you, you know, when you reflect back on days where let's say the index was, or sorry, the um, concentration was more like 80 or something, do you actually notice your, your breathing more rapidly or more, uh, do you notice responses yourselves? Absolutely. Absolutely. In 2000, uh, I believe 2016 or so. The concentration was so high that most people left the area if they could. We drove, my family and I drove north so we could just get away from the smoke because in, in uh, on the Palouse area, Moscow, Pullman area, the concentration was just so hard. It could affect your vision. It gets to that 
high of a concentration, you could actually visibly see it and it changes your vision. So we have experienced the uh, high concentrations, uh, very, very high concentrations, very unhealthy concentration. They color code these and very high concentration turns brown. When it's brown, basically uh, everybody has to be very, very careful, reduce the activity. Uh, we are advised all the time to change uh, air filters very regularly. Uh, of course, some of the air filters are capable of uh, uh, doing the job for PM 2.5, but some of them are just not. Right. That makes sense. So obviously, um, that, that helps us understand what you're talking about, I think. Um, but obviously, it's not so easy for a, a lactating dairy cow to leave the area, nor her caretakers for that matter. So we'll get into that. But let's start with, um, what do we know about, I mean, we could talk about probably any species, I presume, but specifically for lactating dairy cows, what do we know about the impacts of smoke inhalation on these animals? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's one of the main questions we've been trying to answer. So a couple of years ago, we started with just a small sort of preliminary study here at the University of Idaho Dairy Center. And this was all run by my graduate student, Ashley Anderson. So she followed um, a group of primiparous and multiparous Holstein dairy cows across a typical Pacific Northwest wildfire season. So that's roughly from beginning of July through September, end of September. And we collected uh, weekly blood samples so we could get an idea of changes in blood composition and, and inflammatory markers. Um, looking at blood metabolites. We also collected milk samples to assay for composition. Um, we looked at blood chemistry, including blood carbon dioxide levels. Um, and of course, we had daily milk yield data as well from the farm. And what we found was that when particulate matter spiked from wildfires, there was a decrease in milk production in those cows. And that was independent of the temperature humidity index, which we know affects milk production and other parameters in, in dairy cows. And so that was interesting. And, and it was on the order of anywhere between about two to three pounds of milk per day per cow for every 100 microgram per cubic meter increase in PM 2.5. So for example, on those I think in that particular summer when we did that study, the highest the particulate matter concentration went was about 300 micrograms per cubic meter. So on those days, we were losing about nine pounds of milk per cow um, for that day. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, and, and we also looked at lag effects as well. So we could see if there were delayed effects in milk production or if there were persistent effects over time. And what we find is that that milk loss continues for at least seven days after the last day of exposure. So in this particular summer, there was a wildfire event that lasted for seven days. So for seven straight days, particulate matter was pretty high um, on the order of 100 to 300 micrograms per cubic meter. So for that whole seven days, cows were producing less milk, and then they were producing less milk for another seven days after that last day of exposure. So a total of about 14 days in that particular summer. Now, obviously, wildfires are going to change every season. <laughs> and so last year, we had a little bit different patterns where we see uh, we didn't have just one wildfire event. We actually had several sort of smaller wildfire events over the course of the whole summer. So just to give you an idea on how milk production changes, we also find that blood carbon dioxide levels increase when there is elevated PM 2.5. And then we see a lot of interactions between PM 2.5 and temperature humidity index. Specifically, when those two together are elevated, we see changes in blood composition, such as lower red blood cell counts, lower hemoglobin levels, higher basophil counts, and higher eosinophil counts. 
We also see higher respiration rates as well, which is problematic because that means the cows are breathing heavier and faster and probably bringing in more of those pollutants. Um, I think those were the main findings. We also find some changes in metabolism as well, specifically protein and lipid metabolism in the body based on those um, blood metabolite markers. Okay. Yeah. Nine pounds a day over, you know, several weeks. That's not a trivial effect, right? Certainly not a magnitude of the effects of heat stress, especially in the, the Southern United States, but typically, but also, you know, not something to balk at. Yep. What about calves? Uh, I, I'm especially curious, you know, and maybe you haven't got to this point yet, but not only the immediate effects, but do you have any insights over whether there's sort of long-term developmental effects on calves. So on the developmental uh, aspect, we are actually uh, starting to look into those a long term. So we have an ongoing study right now that will look into heifer calves for about six to eight months uh, with, with the bi-weekly and monthly sampling that would allow us to look into the long-term impact. We've had short-term impact, like uh, Dr. Skibble mentioned. There's a lot of uh, changes in uh, blood composition in terms of uh, uh, immune cells, circulating immune cells in terms of hemoglobin, uh, CO2 content. We also have evidence of change in, in uh, non for fatty acid composition as well as uh, other metabolites that relate to energy metabolism. But the, the first study we conducted, Ashley conducted and, and Alex Pace uh, were of short term. We just started a, a new study uh, where we will be looking at uh, six to eight months uh, on heifer calves to look into their growth parameters and, and uh, development and aspect. So for the calves right now, what we know is that when calves are exposed in the pre-weaning period, Again, there are changes in blood composition. So we see overall a decrease in white blood cell count and then specific white blood cell populations as well. We also see increases in acute phase proteins that are involved in the inflammatory response like haptoglobin and serum amyloid A in calves. We also see increases in heart rates, rectal temperatures, respiration rates in calves as well. And interestingly, the changes in blood composition in both cows and calves, we don't see that until three days after the first day of exposure. So the delay in those inflammatory responses um, to wildfire smoke or to the changes in, in immune function. But as Padra mentioned, we are conducting a, a, we're going to be conducting a study to look more longer term. We're also conducting a study that just started a couple of weeks ago where we're looking at in utero exposure as well. Oh, interesting. I, I'm just trying to think as a, you know, as a scientist, like how would you try to do a really controlled study? Do you have opportunities to like have calves in HEPA filtered rooms? So, you know, they're having the same otherwise time of year that they're born and those sorts of things. Or is there any opportunity to do really controlled uh, studies like that? So we are approaching this in two ways. One is that we uh, select uh, same time of calving, same calf age, different locations. For example, the one that the Dr. Skiver just mentioned, we identified a farm in South Dakota. That area was not exposed to wildfire smoke. So, and, and their calving time was matching ours. So we're, we're looking into in utero effect now, we are comparing the calves that were born here from uh, cows that were exposed last summer. In Moscow, Idaho, they were exposed. In South Dakota, they were not. We're mimicking exact feeding methods and procedural uh, uh, details that they have in South Dakota to make it as uh, similar as we possibly can. So that's one approach. The other approach that we're pursuing it now and, and uh, <clears throat> heard some good news from USDA AFI about that is is that we have created a chamber, a, a, <clears throat> a chamber that we could basically put the animal in and, and control the temperature, humidity, and uh, smoke level, particular matter level, 
which would allow us to separate the impact of THI and the smoke uh, PM2.5 effects on, on those uh, uh, metabolism, measures of metabolism or, or immunity. Uh, we built one as a prototype and uh, it's going to be uh, a, a, a long-term project for us. We're going to build another uh, seven to 10. So we have a, a, a unit where we could actually create uh, exactly how much PM2.5 we're feeding into the chamber and then do our measurement. There's a lot of sensors uh, involved to sense different uh, components. This is a large team, of course. Uh, we have HVAC person, we have fire ecologists, we have uh, air gas chemists, and of course, animal scientists. Yeah, veterinary epidemiologists. <laughs> it, it's a large, yeah. uh, it's a large team. It involves uh, several colleagues from Washington State, Oregon State, uh, University of Idaho, uh, Lewiston Clarkston Valley College. Uh, so we have we have put together a large team with different expertise that we can do this in a controlled setting. Sounds like a great approach to this. That's fantastic. Are there other questions that you're currently asking? I, that sounds like a big part of your um, thrust moving forward. But anything else that we haven't talked about? I don't think so. I think right now our focus is trying to understand if there are any long-term effects. And then, of course, the ultimate goal of our research, now that we've established that this is a problem and the you know cows and calves um, are affected by wildfire smoke inhalation, our next step is really to try to figure out mitigation strategies that producers can employ because current recommendations often aren't feasible on farm, such as keeping your animals indoors. Well, a rancher can't do that. Uh, you know, and, and dairy producers often can't do that either, especially in this area where dairy cows are, are out on dry lots. Um, and so we are trying to come up with approaches for that. We have some ideas of, of things that we can do to hopefully reduce exposure of cows um, to those using filters and fans and things like that. Um, and so we will be testing those in the upcoming year or two now that we have some funding um, to do that. <laughs> but the, the biggest thing is really trying to help the producers combat this issue. Uh, one thing I'd like to add to this approach is that uh, being a student in, in inflammation oxidative stress, it's been always a, a goal, long-term goal of ours to look into also um, treatment. When uh, this happens, can we use some type of uh, anti-inflammatory medication to uh, prepare for the immune response uh, that would come from the animal, whether calf or cows, towards this uh, smoke uh, exposure. That's something that we also have uh, a long-term interest as well. That makes a lot of sense. Good. But one question that pops in my head, um, and this is from my experience in, in working with the cooling pads on cross-ventilated barns, like one of the frustrating parts of dealing with that kind of system is those pads that you run water through to cool the air, right? As it's getting pulled through the swamp coolers, they get so dirty. They're accumulating dust, at least on the high plains that they do. But I, I was just thinking, you know, preparing for this conversation, well, that actually might be a benefit in this situation. Is that actually able to some extent to clear some of that particulate matter just because you're running it through sort of a wet filter? And I know in the last few years, there's been some cross-ventilated barns going up in Idaho. Have you guys had a chance to sort of try to look at impacts on cows and cross vents versus dry lots? So this is part of our Western SAR proposal. We are waiting uh, to hear from uh, Western SAR administration uh, uh, in order to uh, pursue this very question. Okay. This actually is part of our uh, proposal. We have, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, four uh, specific objectives uh, that were basically different from our previous uh, efforts in that one, we are comparing the housing, different housing types 
uh, cross ventilated versus open lot where we actually we be using some uh, specific type of filters, air filters. The other one is the impact on forest production. That seemed to be, there seemed to be a lot of uh, observational uh, data from producers with regards to their forest production. The years that they have heavy smoke, they're very much seeing the effect on alpha alpha production as well as corn for corn silage. So that's also part of our Western SAR uh, proposal. We're hopeful. Uh, in March or so to hear some good news about that so we can move that uh, needle forward as well. Great. And on the crop side, I was going to ask that too. Is the assumption or the hypothesis that the negative effects on productivity are just simply due to like shade? I mean, like from the lack of sunlight from the fire smoke? Yes, that that is the main hypothesis, that depending on the severity of the wildfire smoke, you actually get less diffusive radiation um, and that impacts plant growth, right? But it's a little bit more complicated than that because obviously there are a lot of factors that play into the role of the of diffusive um, radiation from the sun. And so when there's, there there are Studies are really equivocal um, because it, it really depends on the conditions and the severity of the smoke plumes. The last uh, and possibly the most important uh, area I, get, I think of, of things could be influenced by this was would be, of course, the people working on the farm. I, and I don't know if that's a focus for you guys in particular, but I am curious, um, what have people been doing during these periods of time when they have to be out you know, taking care of the chores and what have you? I think the answer to that is nothing. I, I don't think, you know, behaviors are changed or there's, you know, personal protective equipment that's often worn. I mean, really the best way to protect yourself from that if you have to be out in it is wearing a mask that can um, block those fine particulates. And in the summer months, it's really awful to wear those because they're hot and it's difficult to breathe. And for that reason, most, if not all, wildland firefighters often don't wear any type of respiratory protection because it's so difficult to walk around and, and move and be able to breathe in those. So, you know, hopefully with technological advances in the next 10, 20 years, we'll see improvements in respiratory protection for workers. But right now, there isn't a whole lot to do. Okay. Are there... And this is, again, probably getting outside of your area of expertise, but to Pradram's point a second ago, are there things that people recommend, okay, if you have to be out in this, if there's really almost nothing you can do, is there anything you can do from a supplement standpoint or anything like that that we know helps the body recover from these challenges? Oh, we had a conversation with the National Beef Council on this. They published uh, our interview one of the main, one of the focus of the conversation actually uh, went towards the uh, proper nutrition in terms of mineral and vitamin supplementation. Uh, not a uh, treatment, but more of a preventive measure. When you have a complete balance, the antioxidant capacity is there, and uh, if if the exposure happens, then the body should be able to uh, deal with it to some extent in terms of uh, 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 redox reaction and antioxidant capacity. So, so far, this is all we know. We have not looked into uh, details of it, but hopefully within the next two to three years, we will have a whole lot more uh, knowledge about the metabolism and changes that happens with um, overall m metabolism. Then we can uh, make some educated uh, recommendation. Sure. And I'll just add that hydration is important. Um, and the reason for that is the moisture in the respiratory system helps to trap and repel those particles that are inhaled. So making sure animals have access to water at all times, and this is important for humans as well, um, is critical to help expel some of those inhaled particulates. Okay. That's a good point too. Very good. Well, this is not, it's not a fun topic, right? But I think the work you guys are doing is super important and um, I'm hopeful that it can help lead to some mitigation efforts, at least uh, to try to 
make the impact slightly less harmful. Absolutely. All right. For a little bit of fun at the end, we always like to ask three questions of all of our guests. Um, and uh, one of the first, the first question we throw at people is what's your favorite dairy related book or resource? Who wants to tackle that one? Okay. My favorite uh, book is, is Lactation and the Mammary Gland by Mike Akers. It's been very helpful. We, t- we, we learned this morning that this is one of Amy's favorite book as well. Yeah. <laughs> as I say, she's supposed to be the lactation physiologist, but okay, yeah, I, I'm not going to shoot down Mike's book. That's great. Amy, what about you? What's your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture then? So outside of agriculture, um, I love fantasy books. So Lord of the Rings trilogy, I've read The Hobbit, I I like the Harry Potter books. <laughs> I'm currently reading Game of Thrones. I just got the Witcher series for Christmas. So that those are my go-to, but I'm also really fascinated by the history of medicine. And so right now I'm also reading the butchering art by Dr. Lindsay um, Fitzherald. And it's all about, it's a nonfiction about the life of Joseph Lister, who is considered the father, father of modern surgery. And he discovered that it was bacteria or germs that were uh, responsible for post-operational infections. And I think, yeah, he was the first person to really apply like this idea of germ theory to, to surgery. And so it, it's a fascinating read. <laughs> nice. I'll have to look that one up. Yeah, that's who Listerine is named after, right? Correct. Yep. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Neat. Okay. All right. So I'll ask you guys both to answer this one. In your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are less successful? Okay. I'll go first. (laughs) So I think for me, it's, um, I think care and creativity are essential. Care is in, you know, we have to be concerned and, and care for the animals and also for the producers, you know, whose livelihoods are, are coming from raising these animals. Um, the creativity, I think, comes into play while we're trying to find novel solutions and innovations to problems. And I think it really involves a balance of science and creative thinking to, to try to make these, you know, big transformative changes in the industry. Very good. Pedro? Adding to those points, I think uh, attention to details and, and keeping up with the recent trends and discoveries uh, will equip a successful professional better than than the others so keeping up with with the science and in paying attention to details uh, basically taking a progressive approach to how we perform our tasks and uh, responsibilities I think will will make uh, in my opinion make a difference good answers well, thank you both so much. This is a great conversation. I certainly learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm pretty sure the listeners uh, are going to learn a lot about smoke inhalation. And, and uh, if they're not in that part of the country, probably be thankful for it, at least in the summer. <laughs> so uh, the drama and Amy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And so this has been another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. If you haven't followed yet, please click that button. And so you don't miss uh, the next episode. Take care.